in order to tackle climate change alongside issues of inequalities, denial of human rights, uh, and the unsustainable management of natural resources uh, that all contribute to the global environmental crisis. So I'm um, looking forward to hearing from this very exciting panel of speakers about the promising practices that they have been uh, researching, implementing, and advocating for. Thank you for joining us, uh, and over to you, Shelley. Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to introduce our panel to you for this uh, for the next uh, one hour, one hour, ten minutes. Um, we have Lorena Aguila, who is our global senior gender advisor for the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Um, Eleanor Blomstrom, who is co-director, head of office, Women's Environment and Development Organization. Professor Abdelatif Katibi, President of the Moroccan Regional Sciences Association. A very warm welcome, thank you. And Ayanda, right on cue, Ayanda Mumvibi, very, very well timed, Program Specialist UN Women. Uh, Dr. Huria Judi, who is our Principal Scientist at C4. And Cecile Jabet, Founder and President of the African Women's Network for Community Management of Forests. So very, very warm welcome to you all. Um, I'd like to start with my first question, and it's kind of, it, it's more of a definition question. And it's a definition question when we talk about gender, we acknowledge that there are men and there are women, and in, in this world of, of, of terms and terminology, um, I'd like to ask Lorena if you could, if you could give us your, um, your kind of your broad overview of, of, of how we should be making reference of, of, of what's the right thing to say when we talk about gender responsiveness and, and, and how we can also you know make more impact with these definitions. Well, th thank you very much. I mean, I, I would like to start by um, acknowledging CIFR, especially Marcus, that for the past, I don't know, three months have been uh, organizing all these processes. Um, thank you, Marcos. I mean, this event and the one that we had at COP um, had been on your shoulders. I have different roles in society, that they have different access to resources, uh, such as land. And we produce these incredible um, um, long books and gender analysis. And very little is done after that. I mean, we keep recognizing the differences, and a lot of people think that that is enough. And, and it is a good step um, in the recognizing the differences. However, um, and, and a lot of the principle of do no harm is associated with it. Like, okay, we recognize this, and if we do activities, I mean, let us not do harm. But for topics such as um, red, and forest landscape restoration, once you identify some of the basic elements, like for example, land, and if you don't address breaking um, those gaps, when you realize that, for example, um, the whole process of participation and, and benefits, it's directed to if you own or you do not own land, then we start talking about what is gender responsive. It's identifying those differences, and doing something to overcome those gender gaps that sometimes not, are not only in women. Sometimes also uh, men confront some of those gaps, like our indigenous people also with the issue of, of tenure. And there are age um, um, elements that um, interact and your ethnicity that interacts. So gender responsive is identifying um, those differences and making something about having an impact in these historical differences when it comes to uh, gender gaps between uh, women and, and men. And it's about doing good as well. And it's very active language as well. And I, I guess, Eleanor, the question is since Paris, since the Paris Agreement, um, what kind of guidance does the Paris Agreement give in the end to providing, to, to ensure that gender considerations are taken into account that we talk about the impact and that we, you know, that we close the gaps um, that Lorraine has just um, explained. Thank you, and, and like Lorraine said, thank you to C4 for organizing this and to everyone for being here. 
Um, so yes, we do, we're a global women's advocacy organization and we've been following the climate negotiations for seven or eight years at least, really with a focus on bringing in a gender equality and women's rights perspective. And it's been a long road, as Lorena knows, because we've worked with her in all of these years. Um, but, and Paris did bring us some good successes, which would never have been possible without our work with allies like the Global Gender and Climate Alliance and without working within the women and gender constituency. Um, but I would say that in our goal of um, a just world and making sure that there's social justice, environmental justice, and gender justice, Paris laid out a framework and a, and a good temperature goal, but it didn't really give us everything that we had gone in there looking for. Um, and so, of course, we have the 1.5 degree goal, which is critical, um, and we need to meet it in order not to um, have islands disappearing, in order not to see serious devastation around the world. Um, and then, but Paris itself didn't, we wanted to have something more operational around gender equality and human rights. And unfortunately, we didn't get it in the operational piece of the document, but there's something in the preamble. And as everyone knows, a preamble means that applies to every single action that's going to be undertaken in terms of Paris. And so in that preamble, there's language on human rights, the rights of indigenous peoples, persons with disabilities, gender equality, and intergenerational equity. And all of these are really critical to any implementation. So that is where we have really some of our best guidance from Paris, but there's also language in adaptation and in capacity building. Unfortunately, um, we're missing language there in terms of technology or finance or mitigation, which are really crucial to having any success in, um, in stemming climate change and really making the systems change that we're looking for. So I think I would say now that it's really in the hands of governments here in Marrakesh to figure out what is our implementation plan. Um, at the same time, it's also in the hands of movements. It's in the hands of civil society to hold our governments to account. And to that point, um, what has been the role of civil society at this COP of action? I mean, what, uh, what, what difference and what discussion and discourses have you been hearing that we can then you know, move forward to an action plan and to, and to seeing some more of the successes on the ground? Well, there's been um, a very diverse group of women as part of the women and gender constituency. We do as a co-focal point of that. And the beauty of the constituency is that it brings together women from all different sectors and levels and kinds of expertise. And they're coming from very grassroots level, but also from more national advocacy level. So they have experience that really complements each other. And we're able to take that um, and build recommendations. And so. Prior to COP, the Women and Gender Constituency put out a document that has 17 demands. And they cross the entire, um, the entire set of issues that's being discussed. And I think one thing that came out that we really wanted was enhanced, um, an enhanced uh, LIMA work program on gender. We needed it extended. We needed more in it. Um, and so we have that now. There was a decision on that. Um, again, it's not perfect, of course, because what we're looking for is system change and finance a real pathway for how it's going to happen. Um, and then I think there's also been quite a bit of action from, from the women's groups on making sure that ambition, the ambition me mechanism is ratcheted up, that there's um, other gender responsive, 100% gender responsive finance. Um, and we really want to see this recognition of solutions that are not simply technological, but rather are coming from the ground, coming from women that are thinking about decentralized energy, that are thinking about how is this having a just impact on communities, but also leading to uh, addressing climate change. Lorena, may I ask you, um, in your experience working with governments at the national level, how are you seeing some of the top level discussions around sustainable development goals, how are you seeing that informing the framework at a much more national level? Um, thank you. Uh, not only the SDGs, I think that um, we have seen uh, an incredible movement at the national level taking some of the mandates that we have already in the Climate Change Convention. Remember, as Eleanor is saying, we have more than 50 plus decisions. 
And when Copenhagen failed, a lot of the countries that had been um, being updated on the linkages of gender and climate change decided to move forward. 2010, Mozambique was the first country in the world to develop what we call climate change gender action plans. And today we have more than 21 countries. And there are um, four countries that have a specific, for example, red roadmaps um, in relation to gender, um, Mexico, um, Uganda, Ghana, uh, and Cameroon. Um, and they're making the difference. The, the, the beauty is that when you get to the national level, that is where we wanted to be eight years ago, but it had taken us eight years to have a mandate. Uh, you find that these um, gender-linked activities, and I like to call them platinal, platinum ripple effect initiatives, because what they do, the beauty is that they mobilize more than one SDG. At the same time, I mean, you're talking about forests, you're talking about climate change, you're talking about poverty, and and that is what the beauty of these initiatives that we're seeing um, on the ground uh, more and more and more are happening. Uh, last night we celebrated the winners of Momentum for Change. Um, there is a stream that is called Women for Results. I will advise you to go and look at that website. Is um, this is the fifth year that we have this, and it has the most incredible type of these ripple effect initiatives that mobilize more than one SDGs. So if I was a donor and I have limited resources, that's the way forward. It's a mitigation, it's an adaptation. Um, so that is what is happening in the country level, in some places. <laughs> Perhaps, uh, Professor Khatibi, you could tell us a little bit more where how it's happening in, in Morocco. I mean, how... How are you engaging with policymakers with what you hear now in terms of, you know, bringing the conversation, uh, you know, bringing it together? Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me here. And uh, I might uh, say that I'm a minority. How does it <laughs> feel? Very good. Welcome to our world. <laughs> Well, regarding what we are doing, uh, I'd like to give uh, just an example of uh, a concrete project in which we are uh, working right now. And it's not uh, very far away from here. It's, it's just in a place where I just learned that my neighbor, she is going to visit the place tomorrow. And you're going to and take her right tomorrow. Yeah. We're going to take her maybe on Friday or tomorrow <laughs> to the area. It's 50 kilometers away from here. It's in the mountains of and the Marcus Atlas. Has to go too because you organized the event. Okay, yeah. very good. <laughs> The whole group, yes, yes, the whole group. It's uh, it's not uh, far away from here. It's 50 kilometers. It's in the Atlas Mountains. It just uh, uh, there we are uh, running a project uh, which is dealing with the integrated water management, and there is a component which is dealing with gender issues, uh, gender sensitivity, gender uh, responsiveness. If uh, we would say that. And um, for that area, I mean, why gender and why that area? The area is uh, exposed mainly to two extreme events. One which is related to flood, flooding, and another one which is uh, related to droughts. And uh, as you know, women uh, in the countryside, in rural areas of Morocco are less educated than men, have less access to resources, are very limited in the mobility, and uh, they are, in that case, very sensitive and very vulnerable to any extreme events, and mostly to floods, which is uh, uh, happening there, uh, and it's being frequent with the climate change right now. The, 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 the that area, in fact, it's very known in Morocco, it's Urika Valley, and it's known not only by its beauty, landscape, uh, scenery, mountains, so the, the the river, but it's now because uh, it happened one very bad flood in there in 1995, but there were a lot of casualties and many, uh, uh, many, uh, the the women, yeah. yes, and ma many deaths, and uh, the majority were women and their children because they don't have this possibility of, mo of moving away from uh, from the area. So there we are running this project and. Uh, the 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 aim of this project is to develop some plan of action integrated 
water management, and we have this component of gender, and to see how the gender is sensitive to this, uh, to this uh, extreme events. And uh, we have uh, run some vulnerability studies in that area, and uh, we demonstrate that, uh, in fact, uh, gender driven women uh, are very vulnerable in, uh, than men, and we have done that in various uh, some ten villages, small communities around the, the valley, and uh, we showed that uh, the, the, the vulnerability. Only we engage women in some uh, reflections. I might come to this uh, point to explain what we are doing exactly with the women. In, in if, if you if you allow. Me. Yeah, I think we'd also be interested to know what the find how the findings are now being developed and how they're now affecting and and how you're using these issues uh, in terms of uh, affecting policy in Morocco. Well, uh, we are trying to affect uh, policy mainly at the local level by implementing actions. And so we are trying to define the ways uh, to increase the adaptive capacity of women by uh, looking to the possibility, the existing possibility or the potential possibility existing of generating extra income or more income for, for women, uh, either by uh, valorizing the natural resources that are there. And we are trying also to increase the sunset, sun, the awareness of women of the the, the 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 risk that is there in there in uh, with floods, and we are trying to increase the relation between women and the information uh, on different risks that exist there. And so we have created, among what we have done for uh, for women and the way we are working with them, we have created a Facebook group of uh, rural women, so we, are, we have chosen these women that have a small uh, literacy, so they can use the tablets and, and communicate with uh, each other. And we have uh, chosen 10, 12 women around the, al along the valley. We equip them with tablets and uh, internet connections uh, for two years, and they are connecting w with themselves, studying w while sharing information about uh, uh, floods, uh, about problems, environmental problems, and how they are dealing with that, and also on trying to develop some solutions from real problems they are facing. For example, one of the problems they are facing when there is a flood is that the pipes that are providing water for villages are broken, and uh, then uh, they have to use the water from the river or somewhere else for drinking. So you know that women in rural areas are the, the ones who are responsible for providing uh, either foods uh, or, uh, or water or f uh, fuel woods for, 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 the, for the household. So they were working on some systems of how to purify water in case of extreme uh, po pollution and they have developed some uh, kind of, uh, of filters. Uh, second uh, action in which they are working right now is how to, because there's uh, this problem of the also of waste, domestic waste, which is not collected and the people are just throwing the waste uh, down the in the river, and they are, they are uh, contributing to the pollution of water. Uh, now we have the, done the studies, uh, chemical studies on the w on the water. I am not going to talk about the scientific studies that were there. Then uh, the one of the possibilities how to develop some way of reducing the waste that is thrown in the, in into the river. And uh, right now they are working on the possibility of doing composting of composting mm. the organic waste in in order to use it either for commercial uh, use if they produce uh, more in the future or uh, just domestically in their own lands, knowing that they are all uh, agricultural women or the wives of agricultural people, because people there are living just for mm, by agricultural I mean, uh, practices. And um, another uh, vulnerability is there is about, uh, for example, uh, yeah, another action in, in which they are working right now is that women are engaged in the action, the community action about s s uh, raising awareness of people there about the how to deal with the, with, with the garbage or, or, or domestic waste. You know, th there is domestic waste and there is also waste that is coming from visitors. The area is very known by the, uh, the visitors that are go there for recreation. People from Marrakesh go there when it's uh, very hot in Marrakesh. There, it's uh, it's, uh, it's a little hot, and people are coming from different parts of Morocco. The vi the, the area now is in high uh, in some uh, periods of time. More than ten thousand people go in there, and they're 
creating a lot of garbage. So they are engaged also in this sensitization, having some uh, statements uh, to communicate to visitors or to uh, local people in order to reduce uh, the, the, the so waste throwing. Yeah, as a, a in great it. example how gender here is being addressed in a specific <coughs> project. But Ayanda, what's interesting is is that still gender considerations are, you know, they're absent in national climate policies. And, and why is that and how can we overcome some of these bottlenecks? Uh, thank you for, for that question. I think the starting point for me is to, uh, again, recognize uh, what has been said, that uh, without the work and the tireless efforts of the women's organization and civil society organization, we wouldn't be having a strong mandate as we have today on, 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 on responses to climate change. Mm -hmm. We have the Paris Agreement in time to force, and we uh, part of the mandate of the uh, Paris Agreement is focusing on the equal participation and benefit of women uh, in climate change responses, but also it calls for systematic integration of gender equality. So if you start by, I mean, like, so the, to come to your question, if you, look at the indicators in terms of the different levels of participation <coughs> and benefit of women at different levels. So if you look at decision making, although there has been some progress in some context at national level in relation to that, but <coughs> we have noted that uh, uh, in particular rural women, rural farmers and so on have been left out of the formal decision-making process. So decision-making process is one key important factor and indicator that we need to take into account to address. But also if you look at uh, to what extent the interventions have helped us to shift the um, inequalities between men and women in different contexts, whether it's age or race or geographical location and so on, you see that women in some context they still walk distances to fetch water. They still do not have access to resources like land. They can't make decisions about what they need to do. And for the policy to really inter intervene, it should articulate how that transformative gender agenda is going to happen. So how are we going to make sure that we increase access and control of productive resources for, for, for women in the different contexts because with climate change with, and with the division of, of, of responsibility between men and women in different contexts, um, people who are still in many contexts responsible for food production for their families and children and so on are women, but without access to resources and economic uh, uh, empowerment it, that's almost so the policy needs to address that. But also, I think the other important thing is that if you do an analysis of different responses on climate change in the different contexts at national level, you will see that there is inconsistency in terms of emphasis. <coughs> and I think that um, the policy should be uh, very clear in terms of what it is that it seeks to achieve over what period of time. Mm -hmm. um, so that it, that becomes very easy to monitor and track and learn and, 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 and focus on that, uh, on that. And what has been useful in most contexts is to, uh, based on very strong evidence or baseline uh, data uh, that uh, you generate to inform your policy, uh, what's been useful is to identify um, agreed targets and indicators at national level so that everyone knows, all the different actors from um, the different stakeholders, they know that this is the end goal and these are the key indicators that will help us to, to achieve that. So it's a combination of different strategies, but also I think the most important thing is um, we should be focusing on rights of women, which is important. We should be looking at what how we're going to transform uh, the unequal gender relations between women in different contexts, and also how we link policies to resources for implementation and monitoring. 
No, I, I want to ask, actually um, ask Lorena to follow up on that in terms of equity and access and decision making. You know, how do we move forward to, to, to create this enabling environment? Well, f uh, first of all, we have to, um, and, and I'm going to go to examples because I, I am a storyteller and I think we understand better when, when we talk about these things. For example, when we're talking about forest landscape restoration and we're talking about RED and, and implementing some of the policies that had been created, one of the first things that we're doing at the national level is creating this fora for um, especially women and women organizations to come and understand what do we mean. I mean, that RED is not a color. That forest landscape restoration, uh, what is Rome? Um, so um, I think that the power of knowledge is very important. It's very important for the groups that we work and, and also pertinent for a lot of the men that are on the field as well. The, the power of knowledge, what is read, um, what are the entry points, what is FLR, how is it going to be conducted, how do you participate in mapping, um, what does it mean, um, where are the species, that analysis and that understanding is for me one of the most important enabling process that we are conducting at the national level. Because then you can identify the risks of how you are participating, what are the opportunities. And that gives you a tremendous amount of power so that you intervene with knowledge and you make, and you understand where you're standing. What are the risks? For example, in the Amazon, when we work with the women on um, red, they understood very, very fast that all the benefits and the possibility of participating was linked to the fact if you own or you did not own the land. So they understood that in the process. So in the meantime, recognizing that land tenure is not something that they could change, they decided that their entry point to red is MRV <coughs> and that they can be trained and can be engaged through monitoring and verification systems. So is, is that power of knowing and understanding so that you can then address the things that you can change, like in Mexico, the women also identify land tenure a problem. They make new arrangements with the men, like give me your land in concessions for 90 years. Okay, you don't want to give it to me, you want to put the title on me, but mean, give me the land for 90 years in concession. But that came um, and, and that power of participating and knowing how to participate was based in having access to knowledge and being able then to in that fully participate and meaningfully participate is very important. Cecile, um, in your experience, when we talk about participation, and as Lorena and Ayanda both talked about the, the, this process of engagement, can you also perhaps give us a give us some insight into your experience of bringing other partners, the non-state actors, into this um, <coughs> participatory role where, we, where it can also act as an influ influencing funnel, so to speak. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the initiative. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks, RRI, to making my participation concrete here in the COP. I think in our own uh, context there, uh, red or climate change and gender is still something which is very, very important. And we, we realize that we have, women have to be on board because we need to understand. And if we want to understand, we should be in to be able to influence. So our network, for example, uh, the African Women Network for Community Management of Forest, we started by organizing women. We realized that we were not that well organized, and if we are not well organized, it's difficult for us to have a space where we can even give our ideas. So we started by getting more organized, and then, as Lorena was saying, it's very important to uh, build the capacities of the women so that they know. They really have to know what are their need? What is the issue? What is climate change? What is red plus for them? What are the consequences? What are their ideas about that? What the role? What is the role they have to play in there? And how can they influence the, the policies that will shape all those mechanisms? So we started that, and we built the capacities of women. We are still doing that through trainings 
through connecting them to decision-making people, connecting them to all these uh, policy makers at, at national level or at even regional level, putting civil society and women organization into platform and, if, and trying to push the government to consider that they cannot do without us. So we did that, we said to the government, in Cameroon, in DRC, we are in there, in Central African Republic, in Burkina Faso, in Cote d'Ivoire. We told to those governments that we, the women, we are the most vulnerable in this process. Climate change has more impact on us than any other. And Red Plus will even worsen our situation because we don't have uh, a property right to anything. In our own context, men are the chief of everything. So we need to get in this so that our need, our ideas, our views are taken into account. And from there, we can move all together. That's how we started with this process. And I'm very happy that it's getting uh, some very uh, positive impact now in the women's engagement. Because also, we have to start from participation to the engagement. And to get into engagement, women should be able to understand, to practice, to live in that, to promote it, and to take it as theirs. Then they can get involved, then they can get engaged, and they know why they have to get engaged. So we are at the level of getting women into more engagement, and to some extent also pushing for meaningful participation because we are not all at the same level. But we have changed policies in Cameroon now. Women can all run. Oh yes, so yes, we have, yeah. we have, we have, we have been uh, uh, influencing the reforms, and in Cameroon, I think we we may be one of the first where we have succeeded to put in the law ownership of land and forests for the women. That's through our RED project. That and that is through RED, because when RED came, we said we don't want RED. But then we understood that if we are outside the RED, the RED will, will just blame you and maybe get you to the, to the jail. We said let's get in, understand, and influence from inside. And our influence now started with all these reforms. And how do you ensure that these this community on the ground, that they, ha they have recognition, that they know what they're doing is successful, and that they, you know, again, that it's this sort of swell of change that they're, you know, it's, it becomes the most normal thing to do. Yeah, when communities, when women at the very community level have the good information, have the good knowledge of what is going on, have the space to express themselves, their <laughs> views and their ideas, can apply and own the process, they do it. They do it. And we, in Rifakov, we are working from the very grassroots level to the very professional and high-level women organization. So from the very, very root, grassroots level, we have women that are organized as leaders, and we connect them to their local authorities, local decision-making people, local policy-making people, and from their local, we try to channel to the national level. That how, and, and we take it to the parliament, because we have also realize that we need to partner, we need to build strategic partners, partnership. And we did it with parliamentarians, with traditional chiefs, because the, the most important actors in these uh, tenure issues are the chief, traditional chief. Because even if the law is positive about uh, women uh, property rights, the practices in the, in, the, in the cultural situation can be very difficult for the women. Horia, could I ask you, really, this is a, a, great, a, a, a great kind of you know, segue into t talking about your work and how you're building this trust and, and basically helping grow demand. I mean, you, you're trying to basically ch you know, change policy on the ground through your research. Uh, thank you very much. I have to say that I love uh, this story Cecil was telling uh, right now because this is exactly 
reflecting the kind of work we, we should do. Also in my, in my work as a, as a researcher in many sub-Saharan yeah. countries, specifically in West Africa, this is exactly what, what I'm, I'm saying, that, or I'm seeing in my, in my work. And what actually you highlighted, and that is the most important thing, is that here we are moving beyond vulnerabilities. We are moving to, to action, to adaptive capacity, to agency of women. So when the women, they get the chance to take their future in their hand, they do it. But we need to give them this opportunity and we need to create the enabling environment for them to do so. And this is where my research, I, I, I found that focusing only on vulnerabilities is good because we need to understand <coughs> and the context is very complex. We need to understand what is going on in our landscapes. We talk about landscapes and I have the feeling sometimes when I'm in these meetings that we, we try to understand every tree we, which is there, eh, the biodiversity of every small plot. But are we understanding the social life of landscapes? Are we understanding power relations? Are we understanding access? And this is where we need to work a little bit more because these two things are linked. They are completely linked. For instance, if you move or you intervene at the environment level of the landscape, you need to know that you are changing power relations. You are changing social relations, you are changing access, you are changing how people will deal with each other, how they are getting access. And this is very important also in the project like I read, that when you intervene, you need to understand which social impact this intervention will have, and one of them is which kind of impact it will have on gender relations. And in your case, which is beautiful, is that women understood that in the beginning, and they took advantage actually of it to get to, to improve their situations. And this is where, where I think that voice and participation, and you are also talking about truly participation, because you see sometimes uh, climate change project or other project where you, you want to, to be gender sensitive or gender responsive, then you have always the three same women coming uh, invited from the national level in the meetings, always the three women or the four or the ten, always the same, always the same role, they silent or they say the same sentences. And that is not what we mean with participation and giving voice to women. Eleanor, oh please, yes, please, 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 please. And, and, and mm. And it has not been only, again, for promoting gender equality, for promoting gender <coughs> equality, but we're seeing, for example, in Brazil, the um, FNR initiatives that we're doing with um, IUCN and WRI, the ones that are taking the risk to start with forest landscape restoration are those women mm -hmm. that we're giving. So, I mean, this is about mobilizing all those different SDGs that we have in, in our pathway. They are the first ones in the communities that um, by allowing them to engage, by allowing them those process said, we, we are the ones that are gonna start with FLR in our communities, just to add. No, to thank that. you, and I, and I guess one of the questions I wanted Eleanor to address is when you hear about the tools and, and the implementation on the ground, you know, how do we, you know, is this enough? Is what, what are we, <coughs> What are we learning from these practices in terms of monitoring and evaluating um, the, these principles? And, and, and I guess, you know, what, what, what challenges do you still, um, do we still face? What do we need to overcome? Uh, that's a pretty big question yeah. about the monitoring and evaluation and what the challenges are, because I think there are many and at multiple levels. There are different ways, of course, to monitor what's happening. We could think about are we monitoring what's happening on the ground level from <coughs> Cecile and her within her network and what they're doing in a project and seeing what they're doing. But the other question is here we are at COP and what is the monitoring, what are the mechanisms to see how countries are actually implementing what this framework is? Um, and are we setting in place anything here in Marrakesh that's going to lead us down that path? I think that question is still up in the air. I wouldn't say that we have any answers on that. Um, we know that there are nationally determined um, contributions and that there are 190, 64 of them have gender in them in some way, shape, or form. But it, none of it is very, is particularly substantive. There are some countries, yes. But I think it's also interesting to note all the countries that include gender are developing countries. So we really need to think about what is the accountability mechanism for developed countries mm -hmm. who have, um, 
you know, been, been funding some of the work on gender and climate change, but are not yet including it in their own action plans as if it's not a relevant issue there. And I think that needs to be challenged and looked at, and how do we build that in? Um, also, in terms of NDCs, you know, we're looking for this ratchet up mechanism so we can avoid three degrees or three plus degrees. And at this time, it's not clear how that will go. Um, and basically, the NDCs have a, a mechanism to sort of support countries if they're not quite making it. And that's not enough. So I think we need to think about, we need to strengthen that mechanism. Um, another mechanism is in terms of finance. And for example, there's the Green Climate Fund. And it has um, gender sensitivity built into it from the beginning. At the same time, not all projects need to have that. They can apply and say, look, we're working on developing our gender plan. And so it's, it's not really strong enough. There's a lot that has to be done. And I think that's where then comes several different roles. One is to really link with what's happening, as um, others have said, with the Sustainable Development Goals and that mechanism, because we know there are national strategies being developed, and they have to be developed in tandem with the climate strategies so that there's a shared set of indicators and targets that we're working towards. And then we need to definitely partner with civil society on the ground who are there and are really the ones who <coughs> are feeling what happens. They know what's going on, and they can come back and say, they can, we can work together as civil society groups, do our own reporting, and at the same time, we need to demand that we're part of any reporting process so that we can say, you know, track the, track the um, indicators ourselves and indicate when things are getting off track so that all of the inputs are actually <coughs> valued, recognized, written down, and then can be addressed in enough time to have some impact. And I just wanted to add one more thing on that. Um, in terms of supporting the tracking of the gender mandates that Lorena was talking about, um, we do has just released an app that we did mm -hmm. together with the um, support of the GGCA and with Switzerland and Finland. And the app is pretty amazing for us because we've collected all the gender mandates and put them out um, sort of in a PDF or in paper form, but almost immediately they become um, out of date. And so now the app will be a living, breathing document where we can track what's happening and we can say, look, you know, United States, you've signed on to this, so here's what you should be doing. And also it's tracking the participation data of who is coming to the UNFCCC and it has some analysis of the NDCs. And all of that will be able to be updated. So I'd recommend thinking of that as one of the tools, certainly not the only one, but it's a useful one out there that we can all use immediately. And it's called the Gender Climate Tracker app. And, 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 and a question on the monitoring mechanisms, um, and I guess first to Horia and Cecile, is just how, what is trickle down? What does trickle down look like? How, how does this work on the ground yeah. in reality? How does it work in the ground? Um, when you, for us, so long as we plan with communities, we have their ideas and their priorities. When we Im implement with communities, they own the process and they can share their perspective and feelings. So for us, it's the basic. We need to get them into planning, and this is not that well done so far, we need to get them into the implementation and then in the monitoring. But to monitor or to evaluate is good for us to have the indicators. What are they looking for? What are the values? What are the achievements? What is the impact of the action on their own livelihood? How do, do these uh, initiatives take into account their objective, because sometimes we have conflicting objective. We are coming with uh, to reduce deforestation. Communities need to improve their livelihood. How far the initiative, the project, or the program have integrated that? And all that should be with indicators. And when they are well trained, they know how to follow up. They do that. In, in our own uh, uh, um, um, realities now, we, we still need to build the capacities of local in that. But they also have a lot to share because they have a lot of traditional knowledge and tools that they have been using to follow up what is going on. This is what I, I can say. But planning with them, implementing with them, developing indicators for monitoring and evaluation, I'm very sure that with that, we can get 
uh, the good impact of any action in the in the in the in the in the ground. Uh, I, I just want to add to that that um, it's very complex issue. And one, one problem I see in terms of why is it uh, difficult to realize is the fragmentation and in, in terms of policy. You have policies, just if I take the example of climate change, I don't want to talk about uh, other policies, it gets even worse. We have mitigation and adaptation since the beginning of this discussion on climate change going in parallel, parallel words. But both of them have, have gender, gender component which is important. So now if you want to monitor one of them, you might have positive impact in terms of mitigation. But then when you add the adaptation, the, you will get a completely different picture. And that I think that the problem at the, at the national level is we need to work in, in more an integrative way in terms of gender to look at policies in, in uh, policies or sectors need to work with each other to communicate and to create a different type of, of monitoring because this is not some one indicator you can just go and then measure. This is, this is much more complex than that. And there are trade-offs and, and co-benefits from each intervention in terms of gender, which are sometimes split in different, different policies, and then you don't get really the real picture if you look only on one. I end, I end it's a hu huge task ahead <laughs> for universal guidelines. It, um, it is. Um, uh, I, mean, like, I, I really like that example that she's mentioned there, because it's really what's happening at... Uh, national level in terms of translating the global mandates. The, the inconsistency, the different definition and understanding, <laughs> there's no shared understanding of what it is that's supposed to happen. And I think um, one critical uh, intervention to, 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 to support that is to provide some guidance on what it is that needs to change from all different levels. So, because you find, I mean like, uh, and, and someone was mentioning now, that if you look at the current indices of the different countries, one prominent um, uh, gender mentioned there is about participation and decision making. But there's no issue around building resilience and empowerment and access to resources and so on. So, a, a, a some guidance in terms of what are the key issues that needs to be addressed <coughs> at the different levels uh, to promote gender equality, but also to promote women's rights and uh, uh, support women in particular to build their resilience and uh, also have access to productive resources. So very strong guidance is, is, is required, which will which will really assist also in terms of um, uniformity uh, in, in, in policy formulation at, 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 national level, at the different national levels in terms of what it is that we aim to address <coughs> and work towards to shift this and, and, and reduce the impact. So perhaps we should just hand over to Hadja Amba, who's our Global Landscape Forum facilitator, gender ambassador to perhaps to have the to, to to maybe just give us your kind of insights as to what you've heard today and and uh, and then we'll take some questions from our yeah, from I'll the floor without the mic um i think um before coming here i came with uh, this idea that i grew up with as as a woman that women are vulnerable and growing up i understand that women should not be perceived as vulnerable or be victimized. That's something that I really don't appreciate, even in like feminist groups and people who actually advocate for women's rights. I don't like the fact that women are constantly being victimized. I think that women have, have this uh, natural resilience power, um, whether they are in rural, I mean, I, can, I grew up in Morocco, so I've seen women in villages far away. Uh, who are actually the ones responsible for the well-being of their children. They're the ones uh, going kilometers away to get the water, to feed their children, to take their children to the schools. And the men are mainly responsible for working and bringing the, 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 uh, the money. Yeah, but who runs the house is actually the woman. So it's, it's very interesting to look at how the community or international community looks at women as being victimized, that's one point. The second point is, um, 
I think everyone would agree with me that the fact that gender inequality or the issue around gender is generally centered in developing countries. It's very much, you know, like women need help in developing countries, but which might, which is true, it is a fact, but I really don't think it's a, it's a global south issue. <laughs> I think it's rather a global issue. It's not just something that only developing countries are um, dealing with. So these are the two points, and I think women are being stronger and stronger every day, even though the circumstances are not very ideal, but it's, it's very good to be a woman. <laughs> It would be great to take some questions um, <coughs> for our panelists. I just want to add something, and it's uh, what we, we see right now. I mean, about these uh, women that are not victimized. What we see now in Morocco, that's in the school. I mean, maybe starting from high school to the university that's the majority of students are just women. Yeah. I mean, if you go right now to the university, at the bachelor level, you find 60% women than men. At the master level, you find maybe 90% women. Uh, this means that <laughs> women are just coming into the decision <laughs> system. And uh, one thing is good, I mean, I mean, if you want to change the the position or to influence the policy is not just by lobbying or something like that. It's just how to empower women and to get them into the decision uh, level where yeah. they can take the decision. And uh, two days ago, we have uh, organized a workshop, a uh, side event like this one with IPCC2 uh, and with the WMO and the IDRC and uh, UNEP on uh, how to empower, uh, how to encourage women to get into the decision in the science, in the climate science and climate change mm -hmm. sciences. So it's kind of how to in encourage women to, to get into the IPCC groups, uh, into the, the support to, uh, to, to be educated, yeah. to participate, to get educated uh, and then to participate yeah. in the climate decisions the, at the international level. My, one of my colleagues who was organizing, excuse me, was organizing <laughs> with me this <laughs> because I just I didn't want to forget uh, because she told me that she uh, she couldn't be with us here, Fatima. That's what I'm talking about. Do we have any questions for? Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much uh, for hearing so much interesting points. And I'm currently an uh, undergraduate student from China. I think if I understand correctly, uh, one or more presenters have mentioned the NDCs of uh, some countries and uh, have mentioned that uh, almost like every uh, country who have mentioned the issue of gender in their NDCs are from developing countries. It seems very interesting to me. and I really want to know like your point of view, what is the reason behind this? interesting phenomenon and is there some kind of belief that this gender inequality is no, no longer an issue in developed countries or what do you think is the main reason behind this? Thank you so much. You want to add that? Do you need to go now? I, I need to go at like 5.10. Well, I, I, I mean, I can start and then I think others can add on because we've all done different kinds of analyses of the NDCs and we all have our, I guess, thoughts and opinions about why countries choose to do things. But I, I, to me, it's that developed countries often do feel that they've made the progress on gender equality and it's about, you know, how are we funding through our international aid and through our capacity building <coughs> that in developing countries. And so developed countries feel like their role may be to work on their mitigation and energy efficiency, not understanding the important role of gender equality and social justice within their own actions at home. Um, I think it very much relates to the Millennium Development Goals too, which were all directed from the North to the South. And so there, there's just, as far as I can tell, a lack of self-awareness. And we saw in a lot of the NDCs that were being developed in developing countries 
that they did engage uh, a broader constituency when they were developing some of them. And some of them included um, groups that were working on rights and working on gender equality and social phenomena. And you see that more reflected on some of those NDCs. That is not the case in the countries that we have asked from developed countries if they engage other groups um, at the national level at the moment that they were developing their um, NDCs. Um, EU doesn't have a mention. Um, United States doesn't have a mention. China doesn't have a mention. And I can continue with the countries on, on the list, but it is important that um, at the moment that they were developed was in this very close little climate change scientist um, group, especially because they don't understand yet sometimes the linkage between mitigation and gender equality as well. Yeah, I think in, in, in most of our developing countries, if gender is mentioned, it's also because we, the, the, the gender and women constituency, we were, we were pushing a little bit. But, and, and it also, for, for us, it's an opportunity for those government to, to, to be built in their capacities because they can also mention it for them to gain some resources and capacity building to better understand gender and, and gender impact in these on all these climate change processes. I think it, we have pushed for that, but it, the main challenge does exist. They do not have capacities to translate all that into concrete and operational actions in the, in the field. I think this is, yeah, very sensitive here. <laughs> sensitive and noisy, are you calling us like that? Uh -huh, okay. <laughs> I just want to add something to that. This is a very important question, I think. And uh, well, the gender, the gender narrative or the gender discussion is always something which is really pola po like in, uh, happens in po polarization. And uh, what I observe in, in uh, some countries I work, you, ha you, you, fi you can find both pictures actually. You find the picture where gender is integrated in a really engagement to make life of women and other uh, groups uh, better. But you have also this tendency, and we, we need also to, to talk about it, is sometimes gender is integrated to please donors because the, the, some institution thinks if I don't have gender there, I will, I will get in trouble. So there is a kind of gender used as a control instance of how your project is implemented. And in this case, you could see exactly that nothing is happening with gender because it's just like we need to put it there and to show this is a buzzword for something, but nothing happens in the reality and no transformations happens in the way projects are implemented. So we have to be careful when we have this is there, we have then to look exactly what is happening in the ground. And this is the only place where you can really understand, is it really meant to transform the society or is it just to please some, some donors? Thank <laughs> you. 
God is coming in a way that did not prepare them to face hell and, and live with a sense of dignity as well. Transformation, wonderful. But how do you talk to the people so that they bring a heart to see? Well, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> this is a fact. I mean, what we observe. If is it good or bad? Uh, maybe the future will tell. But uh, still, I mean, uh, whenever there is imbalance, <coughs> that's not good. What is good is to have the balance, either in education or, or equality or, or whatever. But if uh, peop I mean, uh, guys are dropping out from the school uh, very early. And um, maybe they go for look to look for jobs or whatever. And uh, if they graduated, maybe if they don't have job, what makes also girl go to master level and PhD level? In my my point of view, is uh, there's culture or I mean social status in the in 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 in, in, the, in the the society. If she doesn't go to school to university after graduating and she doesn't have a job, she will stay home. The boys can go look for jobs somewhere else or whatever, at the girls. So the one way of girls, this is, you know, this is just my one explanation. And second is maybe there is this problems maybe of employment and uh, people are just getting, <coughs> uh, I mean, the, the not disappointed after g getting Degree, so we just want to drop f early from and, and go do some something else. And the girls maybe don't have other possibility to do except if they want to to be in this society to go to school. Uh, but uh, I see the the transition uh, in w in the school where I'm teaching. I'm a professor in engineering school for forestry engineers and. Uh, uh, traditionally, we didn't have uh, girls in the school because forester is j men's job. Uh, I mean, traditionally, I mean, but now we are having girls coming since maybe 15 years or so. But since the girls are coming to the school, they are always, uh, in generally, are the in the top uh, uh, of the classification of, uh, of by grades in the, in the school. That means they are working harder or maybe more seriously. Or I don't want to say they are more smart than uh, <laughs> than men because it's not, but it maybe they are more interested and working hard and getting good grades. And it's normal, I am teaching in also in different universities at the master level. And they see w if I have 20 students, uh, generally I have 18 girls, two, two boys. Well, generally speaking, it depends. I mean, so this is the fact, but if it's going in the good way or the, the bad way, I don't know what the future will tell us, but the imbalance will be always in the bad, in the bad way, mainly for in our society, well, uh, Islamic society, where <laughs> we're educated that the man is the, the one who will or is the responsible financially for his household, even though his wom the, 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 the woman is working. I mean, the man is the responsible. The woman can work and can get her salary. She's not obliged to spend it for, 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 for the household. She's not. She's not, I mean, uh, from the, the, but the man is responsible. So if the man is not getting a salary, he's not working, he cannot go for, I mean, uh, uh, getting married. And uh, we are going to witness here some problem also in this marriage. And we, we are witnessing this in the in rural areas where boys go away to look for jobs and stay in maybe somewhere else. And the girls in the rural, rural area are getting older and older and there are no few men to, to get married. To do. This is one, one fact that we have observed also.
for me, I mean, like the question that you're asking is really important one, and it really emphasized the point about the importance of just of when we develop and um, policies, we need to really uh, think through and understand what the situation is and what the indicators are and what it, uh, like in depth analysis of what's happening on the ground is really important to inform the strategies because if we just if people just follow the trends, it's nice to do gender work and let's to get boys and or let's get girls in, in school and so on. You could easily you, you could easily um, um, uh, contribute to undesired results. But if you base your strategies and your programming and your interventions on sound evidence and uh, based on very strong gender analysis how women and girls and our boys and our men, what's happening, what's the income levels, what the education levels, all that data put in one place and analyzed to inform what needs to happen is really important. I think that the most important thing is uh, actually about what is the objective of a society and do we accept marginalization or not? Now, if the marginalization looks like a marginalization of women or marginalization of men or marginalization of pastoralists or marginalization of certain ethnic or marginalization of poor people, this is actually uh, the question. And uh, of course, uh, to come back to the, the, the girls and the boys, I think Hajar was saying something very important, that women look that they are vulnerable or they, uh, they, they are classified as vulnerable, but this vulnerability is actually your strength in the same time because it makes you resilient. And uh, this is why uh, in the school sometimes, because of the roles, I, I am myself from Algeria, and I grew up in a, in, a, in a household where it's clear that if I'm not successful in the school, my mother was always telling me, if you are bad in the school, you get married. <laughs> that was what she was telling me. <laughs> yeah, so the ch I had not so much choices. So I had to be good at the school. <laughs> and, and in some places it's worse. They said a well-educated woman is very difficult to get married. Yeah, of course, that's true. but. It doesn't matter. Uh, what I mean is that we have to understand the social roles, like how you get socialized, your education, and what are the, the options and the choices you have. And I mean, in, in our societies, for instance, if my brother is not good in the school, he is thinking, oh, I can go and work in the construction, or I will migrate. I can, I mean, I, at this time, I couldn't. So this is maybe, it explains why this is the lack of options, or which makes then the, the only option you have is this one, so you go for it, and you get very strong about it. Maybe just to add that in our own context also, you have, when you have girls, in the past, as my mom, she was saying, you, you are there to go to marriage. And those who were going to school were my, my, my brothers. They had everything to go to school, but the girl, when you are 15 or 13 even, you have to go to marriage. So it, it really depends on where we are, which education we have, how have we been educated in this, and what the objective of the society. In my own context, women, when a, 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 the woman have uh, something, it's for the family. She cares better than the man. She knows that she has to, uh, to save. And she, she's thinking of the future compared to the, the husband. So it, it all depends. But I think our society has to be built on values where no one is left behind. That, that's the issue. No one should not be left behind. And if we have that value, then we know how can we make sure our girl and our boy, our daughters and our, our boys are growing up with those values and they are not competing, but they are complementary. Mm. 
that 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 is how I, I see it. Thank you. Thanks. No, I just wanted to say I think uh, maybe a bit of a pessimistic question. I don't know, but. I mean, it's uh, it must have been on all of our minds. I mean, uh, we're you know we we're here together, and we see, you know, we were talking about the extension of the Lima Work Program, and we see a lot of progress, and you know that sh we should recognize that progress and take you know pride in that and and take for sort of strength from that. But at the same time, I don't know, like at least for me, kind of the developments that have been, you know, now with the U.S. election and also what has been happening in a lot of other co other countries, it sort of feels like in terms of especially climate change, gender equality, we're also like, I while we are making progress, the world is sort of going the other way. So, yeah, so I'm just wondering, I mean, we're here together. We have, you know, a really diverse <laughs> panel and, and audience as well. And I wanted to sort of, ask all of you, I mean, we're all here, we all work at different levels in different geographies, uh, we have different approaches, we might not always agree, but we are sort of, we're working towards the same goal. So in this sort of shitty situation that the world is in, how do we maintain that momentum of working, you know, and pushing forward and, and, and moving forward uh, in despite all of it what's happening around us. I mean, do we, do we need to change our strategies? Do we need to, how do we collaborate more? What do we do to keep going forward? Very <laughs> positive way of uh, <laughs> finishing, um, but um, in the past years, I mean, I have been in this process long enough, enough to see that sometimes it goes more to one side than it goes to the other. Uh, we have, um, in the past years, had very positive movement when it comes to recognizing that gender equality and women's rights and human rights are important. Still, when you see how much uh, that is being transformed into dollars and euros investment, we heard yesterday from our finance um, event, between one and two percent. So if those are the people that embrace this, holy macaroni, what is gonna happen <laughs> with the ones that do not believe in that. So if those were the little resources assigned from the believers, what is going to happen to us right now? And Marcus, I think we are terrified. We are, um, we diverse women, I mean, we are African, Latinas, um, Asian, Indian women working on gender, equality, and climate change in a world that is transforming to be non-believers. Um, we don't know how to hold ourselves at this moment. We're terrified, we're worried, we're worried about um, what is gonna happen to this process. And please, if you have an answer, because I mean, we're even worried about our own personal um, well-being um, in the present circumstances. So I don't have an answer to that, Marcus, I'm sorry. I'm still in, uh, terrified and in, and in shock and very worried. Okay, well I am going to try to be less pessimistic and less horrified by everything. Well, maybe not less horrified by recent events, but um, trying to stay, take a step back and think about what does this present us? Where are we? Who do we know that we work with? And what do all of us bring to this in terms of passion and knowledge and experience and influence, honestly, at the different levels we're working with? And how do we turn that into mobilization, into real mobilization? I feel like, <laughs> you know, if we know that the forces are moving against us, we're more likely to mobilize and be less complacent. And so I would like to take that forward, and then think about, there was an event, um, an action that the um, Women and Gender Constituency led, I think last week, called Move the Money. And so we know right now there's one to 2%, right? Going to gender. From the friends? Yeah, from the friends. <laughs> but then we know there are trillions of dollars being spent you know, in military spending. So I think as part of our mobilization, we can continue this, and we can try to 
build an understanding. I just feel like there's so many people, even though they're connected to social media, they're just not understanding everything that's happening in the world. So if we can build that, amplify the voices that we find, the useful, practical, forward-thinking voices, and figure out how do we move the money? How do we make it get to organizations on the ground, women's organizations, feminist organizations, indigenous organizations, and really add to that an accounting and regulation of the private sector? Rather than saying we think corporations are going to solve all of the problems because they're innovative. You know, no, there's no regulation. What are we doing to make sure that corporations are not, on the one hand, saying, oh, you know, we have a sustainability plan, and on the other hand, extracting resources and decimating a community um, that they think no one may ever hear about? So I think that we have this opportunity with our voices and with coming together in our different ways, and I would like to think how we can build on that. Thank you. I think for me, we, in addition to what Leonor has said, we need to build partnerships. We really need to partner with all the stakeholders we can imagine to, to share visions, to work on at least a common, common vision. We need to partner. We need to partner with local. We need to partner with government. We need to partner with donors, with private sector, all these multi-stakeholders who can be interested or involved in any way or in another way. Let partner together and <coughs> see how we can move together. That's first. The second is build capacities on gender. In our own region, in Congo Basin or in Sub-Sahara Africa, we lack gender expertise. We need to train government staff to understand. We need to build the capacities of those government, those leaders who are in charge of the, implement uh, the implementation or the designing of the policies and the implementation of the programs and everything. We need to build capacities on gender so that they understand, they have better knowledge what gender is, what, is, what are the impact of gender on all these climate change and related issues. For me, it's a key. In my, in, my, in my experience, we started, we had, we have benefited from the, the more, one of the most important programs on gender training was between uh, 1995 and 2000. Since then, we have not really got that. There is a lack of expertise in gender. They don't know what gender is. Let train young girls and young boys on gender, the, the transformation we are looking for is coming from there. And build partnership. I saw how partnering with traditional chiefs in, in our countries have, gave a, have really put higher value on what we, have, we are doing. They, were, they wrote to the President of the Republic supporting our proposition to change the law, the land law and the, uh, and the forest law. It, it's very important. For me, it's really how we have to continue. Work in partnership and train young generations and uh, government staff on gender. That will make a difference. Marcus, just to, to add something to that, I really don't want to finish the, the, this side event, which is full of uh, good experiences from different uh, parts of the world in a negative um, note because of what is happening. We know what is happening, but I think, I will say it again, we are resilient. <laughs> we need to build on that. We need to focus on that. We need to connect with each other. And I don't believe that um, after all what we, we reached in this, in this time, all what is, is done now, that uh, we, we need to, to, to stop there and get in a, in a kind of, uh, we need to mobilize more, that is what I mean. And we don't need 
to focus on the on the negative what is happening but posit uh, on the positive which is also a lot there you know when you think of all these women at in the village who work every day to to look for for water for wood for where it's getting more difficult and more difficult and more difficult and they do it every day they try to figure out which with whom how they connect to each other that they make their work less <coughs> less uh, difficult how they create collective action this is what we need to do also at our level